Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Come, come on in, take a seat, and uh, we'll get started with our time of worship here. Uh, good to see you all here this morning. Uh, what a beautiful day after kind of a wild week of humid days and then windy days and then nice and comfortable evening last night. Hope you had a chance to enjoy that. Uh, we welcome you all here this morning, and uh, as we say every Sunday, uh, we here at Discovery exist to proclaim the gospel and equip people to become wholehearted followers of Christ. So uh, just a few announcements that I will highlight this morning. Uh, we have uh, openings in our coffee shop as far as volunteering to help uh, serve and, and to tend to the business that goes on there if you're interested. Uh, we uh, would love to have you help with that. Uh, I guess there is some uh, uh, program and summer reading planners on the welcome desk there. You're welcome to pick up a copy of that. We also uh, are requesting, if any of you have uh, that woman's survey uh, not turned in yet, to please do so in the basket that's back there and get those filled out and turned in. So... Uh, as, as you know by now, uh, Pastor Corey is, is still on vacation, but he is planning on being back in the office on Tuesday. So we uh, continue to give thanks for his time away and uh, hope that it's been a time of refreshment for him and his family. So with that, uh, why don't you stand and greet those around you, and then Joel will come and give the guitar to worship. All right, church family, let's find our seats. Praise God for this beautiful morning as we come together as God's people and worship him. Our call to worship this morning will come from Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. This is God's word. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Let's pray together. Father, our past is hopeless. Our past is helpless. The imagery is one of miry, a miry pit. And it isn't just a cycle. It says that you drew us up. We were at the bottom. We could not help ourselves. But then you graciously gave us the gospel. You gave us Christ. You gave us mercy. And Father, we rejoice in that. But you didn't stop there. You also gave us all the resources that we need to live a life of joy and gratitude. And it all redounds back to you because you are so good and you deserve all the glory for what you've done in our midst. Father, we pray that you would continue to do that. Draw out from the pit of sin and make your name great in this generation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. How awesome it is to proclaim the greatness of our God. Uh, you know, we were studying in Exodus today in the chapter 40. 
when the tabernacle was completed and the people were ready to gather for worship, it says that the cloud of the glory of the Lord filled the temple so strongly that Moses couldn't even enter it. Can you imagine that? And that same glory comes to us every time we gather, every time we pray, every time we seek the Lord's face. So let's do that this morning. Let's uh, seek him and uh, lay our burdens down before him and just uh, trust in his greatness. Won't you pray with me? Gracious Father, Sometimes it's hard to just describe uh, how great you are. Uh, we try to do it with our songs and our prayers, but sometimes it seems so inadequate. So Lord, we come to you this morning. We, we come with our sin and with our doubt, with our anger, with our frustration. Lord, we don't always understand what goes on in this world and the purpose of all these heartaches, Lord. I, I think of those affected by the, the flooding of, of the recent week. And it's hard to grasp uh, why, why people need, have to go through these tough times from the shootings to the, to the griping about our government and just everything that goes on, Lord, it just is disheartening sometimes. But Lord, we, we know, we know you have a purpose in all of this. We know that you are in control of all of this. We know that you, we can trust in you completely. Uh, for we have been redeemed, we have been forgiven, Lord. As we just sang, Lord, uh, you came and sent your son to bleed to die for our sin and and for that lord we are eternally grateful we don't deserve your mercy but you offer it to us so we just pray this morning for our church for our pastor for his family we thank you that he was able to take a much needed vacation and time of rest. And now as he comes back uh, to serve us this next week, we just pray that he will be renewed and strengthened for what lies ahead. Lord, I pray for Pastor Ryan who will be preaching this morning and, and just anoint him with your words. Help us to be attentive to those words. And we know that uh, you have uh, much to say to us. So we, we pray for that. We pray uh, just for this community, Lord, that you have placed us in. We, we pray that uh, through our lives, Lord, that uh, people will be drawn to you by every little thing that uh, you instruct us to do, Lord. Sometimes it seems small and insignificant, but Lord, even a glass of water given in your name can uh, reap rewards for your kingdom. So Lord, we pray this morning as we give and as we uh, just uh, work to further your kingdom here in this community, we just pray you'll bless our offerings, Lord, now as we give to your work. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Ryan Franchuk. And, uh, I'm here with my wife, Sally, and uh, one of our children, our daughter Evangeline, and uh, our other boys are up at Bible camp uh, for the summer or for the week or whatever, so it's good to be with you again, and uh, good, to, good to see old friends and meet new friends. So um, I'm delighted to uh, yeah, get, to, get to share God's word with you this morning, and uh, I invite you to turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 20 is what uh, the text is that we'll be considering. Today, and so I'll read the text, I'll read the passage, Isaiah 1, 1 through 20. And so you can pull that up on your phone or open it up in your Bible or however you're receiving the word this morning. And uh, we'll read it together and then I'll pray for us and then we'll dive in. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. It says, 
The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, but the donkey, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds From before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Give thanks to God for it. Would you pray with me one more time? O Lord, help us now as we uh, quiet our hearts before you, as we seek to be submissive to what you have said. We believe this to be the very words of God that you have inspired uh, your servant Isaiah to deliver. And so we ask that you would... uh, just make us ready to, to hear it and to believe it and to obey it. So help us now as we think about these things in more detail. Help us to have hearts that are truly oriented the way that you call them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. In my observation, uh, I sense that the, the word or the idea of repentance is something of a hated concept or at least a rejected concept in our modern society because the very, the very concept implies or, or necessitates that we admit that there's something wrong with us, right? There's something not perfect. There's something not good that should change. And like I said, I think like the modern world and society essentially reject this idea wholesale uh, because instead we're told what's the constant messaging from uh, the 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 trenders, the movers and the shakers and the influencers in our world today. What's the constant messaging? Isn't it that about the worst, most damaging, most dangerous thing that you could think or be told is that there's something wrong about you, right? Instead, the messaging is you're perfect just the way you are. You can do anything if you set your mind to it. You should believe in yourself. Uh, I found uh, in a quick quick Google uh, on For some reason, on the U.S. Oral Surgery Management website, uh, 50 positive self-affirmations. So this was 
uh, 50 positive self-affirmations that they were suggesting, the U.S. Oral Surgeon Management um, website anyway, is suggesting that you and I internalize and kind of repeat and say to or preach to ourselves as a sort of mantra. Here are a few of them. Uh, I am successful. I am confident. I am powerful. I am strong. I am getting better and better every day. All I need is within me right now. I wake up motivated. I am an unstoppable force of nature. I am a living, breathing example of motivation. I am living with abundance. I'm having a positive and inspiring impact on the people I come into contact with. I am inspiring people through my work. I'm rising above the thoughts that are trying to make me angry or afraid. Today is a phenomenal day. I am turning down the volume of negativity in my life while simultaneously turning up the volume of positivity. I am filled with focus. I am not pushed by my problems. I'm led by my dreams. I'm grateful for everything I have in my life. I am independent and self-sufficient. I can be whatever I want to be. I'm not defined by my past. I am driven by my future. I use obstacles to motivate me to learn and grow. Today will be a productive day. I am intelligent and focused. And don't get me wrong. Some of those things are good and true and are things that we maybe should, would be appropriate things to say to ourselves. But the reality is that that's not the intention behind the messaging, right? The reality is, is that you and I aren't God. We're not perfect. We're not majestic. We're not glorious. We're not holy quite like He is. or even remotely close. Every time that you and I do something or say something or think something, even something seemingly small or insignificant, that's in contrast or contrary to what God has called us to do and be, we're sinning. Every time we say something, even something thoughtless or hasty or in jest that doesn't conform to what God wants, we're sinning. Remember Matthew 5.22, Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Every time we think something contrary to what God asks of us, even if we but entertain a sinful thought for a moment too long, we've fallen short of the glory of the perfect and infinite God. There's ever a moment in our lives where we're not loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're falling short. We're sinning. That's what God calls us to in Deuteronomy 6 and other places. God calls humanity, calls you and me, to nothing short of moral perfection because He Himself is perfect. In Matthew 5.48, Jesus again said, You must therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so in the light of what God has said, in the light of what God has revealed about who He is and who we are, we have to admit that there must be some place for change, for repentance. Isaiah's uh, prophetic ministry took place uh, probably sometime in the years around 740 to 687 B.C. Uh, and so about 700 and some years before Jesus came to earth, if this is the year A.D. 2024, then we measure back about 2,000 years to approximately the time that Jesus lived among us and walked and lived and died and rose again. Uh, and so this one, Isaiah's ministry, the, the oracles he was delivering from the Lord would have been some 700 years before that even. And so almost 3,000 years ago. And it, perhaps you remember that in the context of Isaiah's ministry, he's a, a prophet to what was called the southern kingdom, to the kingdom of Judah. Before that, Israel had been a united kingdom, a, a, a monarchy under Saul and David and Solomon, right? But then with Solomon's son Rehoboam, everything kind of fell apart, and they split into a northern kingdom that was called Israel or Samaria or Ephraim, and then a southern kingdom, Judah, uh, which had a capital city of Jerusalem. And that's, that's, so that's where, that was sort of the locus of where Isaiah was doing his ministry. And this was a time uh, when he was active of uh, aggressive Assyrian expansion. Assyria was sort of the global superpower of that day. They had destroyed the northern kingdom Israel in 722, uh, and then they seriously threatened Judah. A little bit before that, uh, Israel and, and Syria had tried to get together against Assyria and had tried to coerce uh, or coax Judah into an alliance with them and said, hey, come on, let's, let's uh, come with us and we'll, we'll keep you safe. Let's, let's go against Assyria. And, uh, and Judah uh, refused to join up with them, but they also didn't trust the Lord like he had called them to. And so uh, they, uh, ever since that point, when they sort of, when King Ahaz 
sort of turned his back on, on trusting the Lord and instead threw his lot in with the Assyrians. Uh, basically, even the southern kingdom, even Judah, was something of a vassal state of Assyria. Um, and so what, um, if you think about Isaiah, maybe what you think about are you know, some of the later chapters like Isaiah 53 and the great prophecy of the suffering servant who would come as a Messiah to die and, and, uh, and pay for the sins of his people. But maybe you also think of Isaiah chapter 6, where, which we, we sense is the, the call of Isaiah to his prophetic ministry. Where he has that vision of the Lord uh, as holy, 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 and high and lifted up. Um, but this, the passage that we're reading this morning, uh, it seems deliberately timeless, doesn't it? You'll notice that there aren't any real references to certain kings or to certain contexts or anything like that. Rather, it seems intentionally uh, sort of um, applicable to Israel or Judah in whatever state of life they were in, and perhaps even uh, for us. And the premise here is pretty straightforward in our passage, namely that God's chosen people had maintained a good and wholesome and religious appearance, but in their hearts, and as a society, they had ignored the Lord. They had disobeyed Him. So they were in a world of trouble and calamity as the consequence for their evil. But God Nevertheless, we saw that in the later part. God is graciously calling them back, promising them restoration if they would but repent from the heart. And I think that premise of this first chapter is essentially the same for you and me as well, even though we live some 2,700 years removed and under a new covenant. We sometimes think that as long as we maintain the forms, the appearance, the outward expression of righteousness, then everything's cool. We sometimes think that as long as we have that edifice there of looking like a good person or a good Christian, then everything's cool. I mean, after all, what else does God want from us? What does God want from me and you as individuals as, and as a people, as the church? Doesn't he want us to try to be good people? Doesn't he want us to get to church when it doesn't conflict with our schedule, to work hard, to pray the Lord's Prayer, to get our kids to their sporting events and respect the flag and don't kill anybody, right? Stand for the reading of the Bible. Have Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving. Vote for old-fashioned values. Listen to Christian radio. Give maybe even some money, maybe even 10% to the church or to a ministry. Aren't these good things? Isn't this what God wants from you and me? Well, look at verses 2 through 9 in Isaiah chapter 1. If you have your Bible open... Uh, invite you to look at that, those, those verses with me again. Here the Lord sets up his argument to Israel, or to Judah, excuse me, uh, as something of a, sort of a, in a legal context, right? It, it almost kind of evokes the imagery of a law court. Uh, and God is now seemingly bringing charges against his people against Judah. Because he says in verse 2, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. It's like he's summoning the heavens and the earth themselves to come and be witnesses against Judah and bring charges against them as the Lord um, speaks his case. And he says, you've rebelled against me. You know, beasts of burden, this is what he says in verse 3, beasts of burden listen to their owners. <laughs> but not you, Judah. He says they don't know him anymore. And so in verse 4, he levels the charge that the whole people is sinful. He calls them a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, children who deal corruptly. He says, they have forsaken and despised the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And so they're now estranged from Him. Their relationship with Him has been broken and severed. And in verses 5 and 6, he details how their corruption runs deeply. It's like an illness that has penetrated the whole body. He says um, in verse 5, the whole head is sick. The whole heart faint from the sole of the foot. Even to the head, there's no soundness in it. He says, all your bruises and sores and raw wounds are not doing anything. Nothing's being done to take care of, of your, your spiritual condition. It penetrates the whole being. You know, sin isn't just a vice that we entertain every now and then, right? We sometimes make light of our, our, our vices, our habits that are, that are wrong, that are sinful. We say, oh, I know it's bad, and we kind of grin and say, aren't I allowed just this one thing? This is my one vice. But sin, sin is a sickness. 
that pervades everything, pervades the whole person. And in verses 7, 8, and 9, he details how the nation is just now in tatters as a result of their sin. He puts words in their mouth in verse 9. Uh, he kind of now, like, the perspective changes a little bit as God sort of presents Judah as saying, if the Lord had, had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in other words, right, completely decimated. Sodom and Gomorrah, you recall, were ruinated with fire and brimstone from heaven and were left nothing but a smoldering ruin. And so um, God has a pretty serious charge against, against the people here. And in verses 10 through 15, kind of the next section, we see what God doesn't want. We see what God doesn't want. If we're asking the question, what does God want from me? If Judah were asking the question, what does God want from us? If we're asking the same question, we see what he doesn't want necessarily in verses 10 through 15. Namely, an outward religiosity. He charges that his people are brimful with sin. And then in verse 10, after putting words in their mouth about being like Sodom and Gomorrah, he turns the tables and addresses them as though they were the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. He puts them in the same category, the same class. But look what they've been doing. They've been really pious and scrupulous with their religion. Because now look what, look what he says they've been doing. Verse 11. He says, they've been bringing a multitude of sacrifices. They've been bringing burnt offerings of rams, the fat of well-fed beasts, the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. He says in verse 12 that they'd been gathering together in his courts. He says in verse 13 they'd been bringing offerings and offering incense. They'd been celebrating, he says in verse 13, right, a new moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, their solemn assemblies. In verse 14 they've been they've been um, recognizing new moons and appointed feasts for the Lord. In verse 15 he says they've been making many prayers. And so I ask, and maybe you ask too as you read that, well, what more would God want? I mean, doesn't, don't those things that he just cataloged comprise the bulk of Old Testament religion, right? I mean, if you've been on your Bible reading plan starting in January and you made it through Genesis and then you got to Exodus and then you went through Leviticus and Numbers, right? What do you get for chapter after chapter after chapter? Don't you get the Lord calling his people to make with detailed instruction to make offering after offering to celebrate feasts to keep the sabbath to celebrate solemn convocations as a people isn't this what he wants isn't this what god wants people who publicly conform to the rules isn't this what he wants a society that acknowledges him and is official about it it seems like judah had been doing those things I saw a couple weeks ago that the state of Louisiana made national news for passing, maybe you saw this, pass, they passed a bill requiring the display of the Ten Commandments in every classroom, in every public school and state-funded university. The bill even says, quote, in large, easily readable font. I love that they were thoughtful enough to, um, to, to specify that. Isn't that a good step for the program that so many people are intent on, right? Getting America back to God. If that's the case, then why is God so adamant in his rejection of it all as he's talking to Judah? He just dismisses it wholesale. It'd be hard for him to be more dismissive of it, wouldn't it? In verse 11, he says, I'm fed up. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Verse 13, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. He says, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. He says in verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They're a burden to God. He's weary of them. He says in verse 15, even he doesn't, he doesn't listen to their prayers. I don't hear them. So we ask, what more could he possibly want? Well, it's plain what he doesn't want, isn't it? Outward religiosity that doesn't have any heart to it. So many people called Christians in our day, I think, fit this rather well. So many people that call themselves Christians speak regularly of God. They're good American Christians who get themselves to church. 
pray before meals, perhaps bemoan the radical immorality of our culture. They don't cheat on their taxes, take their kids to church activities when it doesn't conflict with sports. Maybe they vote for politicians who claim to exemplify Christian values. What's missing? Verse 15 ends with God's denunciation of Israel's prayers by saying, what does he say? Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. So I think this is the key. Namely, that all your outward rule following and religious observance is worthless if you don't have a heart truly given to God. If you pray and you pray and you pray, but at the same time you're devoted to getting what you want by violence or mistreatment of others, then all the prayers in the world avail you nothing. You can bring whole flocks of herds uh, and uh, flocks and herds of animals in sacrifice, but they're all vain offerings if in your heart and in your life. You don't care about loving God and loving your neighbor. And so what does God want? Verses 16 and 17, I think, detail what God really wants, namely true repentance. What does God want from me? What does God want from you? What did God want from Judah? What does God want from his people? True, heartfelt repentance. He says in verses 16 and 17, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. God desires not just a life that maintains the vague appearance of obedience, but a heart that loves him and is so grieved and broken by its sin that it changes its behavior. It's sort of like when you're working with kids or if you've your parent, um, you know, and you have one kid who is mean to another kid, or a kid who's, you know, does something bad to the other kid, and you're in charge, you're kind of the adult in the room or whatever, what do you do with the, the kid that hurt the other kid? <clears throat> Go say you're sorry, right? <laughs> we direct them of what they should do. Go, Go and tell your sister that you're sorry. Go apologize to your sister. And what does the kid do? Sullenly marches over, sorry, right? Well, whoop de doo right? Like, you go to tell a kid to apologize, of course you don't mean, you know what, just get the form right. You know, just mouth the words correctly. That's not what you're asking. That's not what you want when you tell, tell a kid to go apologize to another kid. You're not saying, just look like it's, just, just look like you're, you're really genuinely saying, no. You want, what do you want? You want them in their very heart to recognize, wow, I was genuinely bad to that person. And I feel badly about that, and I want to make it right. That, isn't, that what you're, isn't that what you want when you, you tell a kid, go say you're sorry? Right? Isn't that what, don't you want the heartfelt acknowledgement of, wow, what I did was evil, and I shouldn't have done that, and I'm so sorry. You want them to express that then to the person they hurt and to, to change their behavior. You want them to not only feel it, but to own it. To move from head knowledge of its wrongness to a heart knowledge of its wrongness. And so God calls Israel, in verse 16, to a personal repentance. He says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. He calls them to reform their hearts, which result in a change of thought and behavior. And then in verse 17, he calls them not just to individual repentance, but even to society-wide reformation to express their repentance at the civic level by how they treat the needy and the marginalized among them. Cause them to make sure that their community and civil organization makes a priority of fairness and safety and provision for those who are vulnerable among them. He says, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. It's kind of interesting to me, I just offer this as an observation, how sometimes evangelicals, uh, you know, that you and I would maybe classify ourselves as are people who think that the government should vocally express and codify Judeo-Christian values, but at the same time, we don't think the government should have any part in safety nets or social welfare programs. But isn't the recurring call of the prophets to theocratic Israel precisely that, that 
the way that they knew you were walking in step with God's heart as a nation was that they corporately took care of the poor. They didn't let the wealthy and the elite take advantage of them. And so what God wants is, the individual level, even to the level of the society of his people, he wants a genuine heartfelt repentance. And in verses 18, 19, and 20, we see God's personal appeal and invitation to them. After what seems like the most scalding reproof, the sternest reprimand, God graciously appeals to Israel with one of the most, I think this is one of the most tender verses in the whole Bible. Verse 18, Come now, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. God says, you're my people and everything you've done to estrange yourselves from me, even now. Even now there's still hope. And God makes a personal appeal. Your sins will be washed clean. Return to the Lord in repentance. And your sins will be washed clean. God says, I will wash you and make you white as snow or like wool in contrast to the dark red blood of scarlet and crimson. Now, yeah, at this point you might ask, isn't this what the whole sacrificial system was set up for? And God just said he's, 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 not, he's, sick, he's sick of them bringing offerings to him. But isn't that what he set up the whole system for? To atone for sin. He just said he doesn't delight in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Then how can God promise this? That he can make their sins, though they're red like scarlet and crimson, they shall be like wool. How can he make good on this? And I would say and this is one of those incredible promises of the Old Testament that finds its fullest expression and fulfillment in Jesus' New Testament uh, coming, in his dying and rising again, in his fulfillment of God's promises. I would say that this forgiveness, this cleansing of sins was effected ultimately when Jesus, the, the, the true and, and perfect Lamb of God died on a cross, shed his own blood in the place of sinners but didn't stay dead, but nevertheless rose on the third day. And in other words, it was never about the blood of the bulls. It was never ultimately, it was never truly, it was never that a goat's blood could literally take away somebody's sin. But rather they were, they were only effective insofar as they pointed ahead to and would be completed by an ultimate sacrifice. Namely the very Son of God. Namely Jesus dying on the cross. I mean think about it. How could a, how could a goat's blood or burning the flesh of a, of a bull to God, how could that do anything to atone for sin? <laughs> But in light of Jesus, God himself, nevertheless coming to earth, incarnating, becoming a human being, being like the very, being made like the very people that he created, and dying in their place. Well, that, that has power. That does something. That cleanses people from their sin. That's, and now do you hear this? Do you hear this appeal of God to Judah? Come, let's reason together. Your sins are they're bad. They're dark red. I will wash you clean. Do you hear that to Judah? Do you also understand that God offers the same to you? God says to every man or woman or child who recognizes my sin, my sins, that's yeah, bad. I don't have any hope. I can't do anything about it. I could try to be a good person, but I fall on my face every other moment. <laughs> what do I do? How can I have any fellowship with the God who made me? A perfect God. And now you see, this is such good news that that same perfect God loves his people. He loves you. He calls you. If you will but repent of your sin, put your faith in Jesus. If you'll but turn away and agree with God, yes, my sin is bad. Yes, my sin is wrong. Yes, I hate it. 
I just like it. I don't want it there anymore. God, I can't do it on my own. I cry out now to Jesus. Jesus saves sinners. This tender call of the Lord to His people Judah is the same call now today to you, to me. I just pray if you if you don't know the joy and the relief of forgiveness with God. Hope. Peace with the one who made you. I pray, my prayer for you this morning is that you would receive Christ. You would put your faith in Christ. That you would repent of your sin from the heart. Turn to the Lord and say, God, I now trust your Son as a sacrifice for my sins and not my soul. Seeing our sin in the light of what they truly do, um, it's kind of an eye-opening experience. It doesn't just harm us. It doesn't just harm others. But it darkens and dampens our relationship and our communion with God. Maybe you've wondered about that weird... Have you ever read Psalm 51 and wondered about that weird, that weird phrase? I think it's in verse 4 where he says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. I mean, what was David's, well, the context there is David, the king of Israel, had seen Bathsheba and wanted her, and taken her for himself, likely forcibly, and then saw her, you know, recognized, oh, I need to cover this up, and so invited her husband home from the battlefield to try to make it look like her pregnancy was from him and not King David. Of course, he's too good of a man to, to come home and be comforted by his wife when he's on the battlefield. And so that plan fails. So David has her husband Uriah killed in, in the thickest part of the battle. And he covers it all up for nine months until Bathsheba has a child. And then remember the prophet Nathan that God sends to confront him in his sin. How in the world could David say, against you, you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight? Right? Did, he, did his sin not also affect Bathsheba? I think she would say it did. How about Uriah? Surely, right? How about the nation? Yes. How about the kid? Yes. So in what sense could David possibly say that it was against God only that he'd sinned? And I don't think David was denying that he'd done evil against others and affected them horrifically. I think what he's doing instead is ex expressing poetically something fundamental about sin. Namely that it's first and foremost an offense against the holy God because everything that's right, everything that's good, everything that's pure, everything that's holy flows from the very character of God and from nowhere else. What ultimately makes sin sinful is that it's a, is that goodness flows from who God is. Goodness doesn't flow from who Bathsheba is. Goodness doesn't flow ontologically from, from who Uriah was, or from David, or from you and from me. No, what makes sin sin is that goodness flows from the very character of God himself. And so when you sin, there is, yes, ultimately you violated uh, the very standard that flows from God's heart. Your sin does have effects on others and on ourselves, but yet that's somehow secondary to this primary thing, that sin fractures our communion with God. And so what Isaiah says here is that you and I could be as devoted as anybody to the outward and perfunctory acts of faith and give lip service all day long to God, but without true repentance, it's useless and vain. So God says, Psalm 712, he calls everyone to repent and believe. He says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Or in Luke 13, 1 through 5, remember Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And at the same time, repentance isn't just for people who aren't Christians yet. It's for believers too. Think of Revelation 3.19. Jesus says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Or in Matthew 6.12, Jesus taught his, us, his disciples, to, to pray, Forgive us our debts, 
or our trespasses and deliver us from evil. Or Proverbs 28:13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will receive mercy. Or James chapter 4, you maybe remember chapter 4, verses 4 through 10, calls, calls people who have professed faith in Christ, says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. It sounds very, very similar to the language of Isaiah. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Grieve, be wretched and mourn and weep. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Because the reality is that sin hinders the relationship between God and the creature. Just like when you offend your mom or your dad, kids, right? When you've done something bad. Or for everybody, if your friend or your coworker or somebody at church does something that angers you or saddens you, what happens? The air isn't clear anymore. You don't enjoy the sort of full joy and fellowship of your relationship. That's, instead, it's hindered, it's quenched. And so it is when we sin and don't acknowledge it, when we don't deal with it, we just try to hide it. Our joy in God is quenched. Our prayers become dry or non-existent. We draw away from God, perhaps hoping to still somehow hang on to that little bit of anger or greed or complaining or lust or prejudice or irritability or laziness or doubt or cowardice or lying or whatever it is in the hope that oh, maybe I can indulge in that again sometime soon. And so inexplicably, we try to hide from the one who sees everything. We try to lock things away in our hearts of which God plum plums the depths at every moment. But there's good news. Isn't there? There's good news that God loves us and forgive sinners. When Jesus came, he was the ultimate sacrificial lamb who died on a cross in our place. When Jesus died, he bore our sins in his own body, took the just punishment of God for sin on himself. And so now every person who simply trusts Jesus is washed clean of their sin. Sin is nailed to the cross. We bear it no more, and we don't have to live in its guilt anymore. And we don't have to try to hide it. We don't have to try to hide anything anymore. We don't have to try to be something or someone we're not. We don't have to put on the outward airs of religiosity when inside we're not walking in communion with God. And we don't have to be afraid of God or hell anymore because Jesus has taken it all. And so God invites us here and so many other places in the Bible. He invites us, let's just come clean. Let's just come clean come clean with him let's just be open and forthright and let's agree with him that what we've done is bad or wrong that we're harboring bad things we've thought bad things we've done bad things and we agree with god that's bad it's wrong i don't want this anymore and let's turn back to him in repentance and in faith and you'll find that if you put your faith in jesus that glory of glories <laughs> it's already taken care of let me pray for you. Oh God, I ask for Discovery Church that you would bless these dear saints. That uh, if any of them are walking in the grip of some sin this morning that still has a stranglehold on them and they recognize now that's where they're at and they hate it. God, would you work a deep dislike of sin in their life? Would you work a deep love for you, for your word, and for truth instead to be placed there? Would you bring them back to yourself in repentance? And would you cast all our eyes to Jesus, the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith? May we walk in the joy and freedom of those who know they've been forgiven from the heart, who know that someone else's blood, the blood of the very Son of God, has been shed on their behalf. And Lord, if that's the reality we know, that's the reality we believe, that's what we trust. And God, fill us with joy and freedom. And may Discovery Church overflow with glory, with freedom, with happiness in Christ. And would they just uh, know more and more an unhindered love for one another and for you and for the poor and the needy, for everyone who comes through their doors and for everyone in their daily lives and for everyone in their sphere of influence. Lord, fill us all with love for you and then a love for others. 
I ask it in Jesus' name. Today's benediction comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 11, and I'll be reading it from the NASB. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne of the living creature and the elders, and the number of them was myriads upon myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. You are dismissed.